Well, we're in the second week of a five-week series entitled Wisdom. And we realize that we all make dumb choices, don't we? Am I the only one that says, listen, I know that I've probably made more dumb choices than the average person, but we have all made dumb choices. Last week, we looked at finances and the choices we make financially, and we really understood that the reason we've made dumb decisions in the past with our finances is because it's an issue of our heart. The Word says that where your, where your uh, treasures are, there, or where your heart is, there your treasures will be also, right? In other words, we'll spend on the things that we're, we, we, we enjoy. And so where is our heart? What is our heart in? And today we're going to talk about a little deeper subject. It gets a little deeper than finances. Can somebody say amen? amen. We're going to talk about relationships, all right? And I haven't gotten much um, more feedback from a series than I have from this one. Last week, a lot of people told me how they were being challenged by this wisdom series, and I think that's because a lot of you are like me, and we just do dumb things. Uh, but this is going to step on our toes, it is going to get in our face, and that's a good thing, Amen. all right? If you're going to get angry at somebody, don't get angry at the messenger, get angry at the word, all right? And, and do something about it. So, uh, but we've all done dumb things in our life, and that's what this series is about. How do we make God-honoring God decisions? It all flows from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, that says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. What's the foundation of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom, and all the wives said amen on that one, uh, results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. Wisdom will actually increase your lifespan. How many of you have ever done anything so dumb so stupid that you almost lost your life. Am I the only one in the house today? Listen, I remember when I was in middle school and we were, we, I grew up at the base of Mount Rainier out in Washington State. Uh, go Seahawks, I'll just say that. And we used to white water raft in the summer. So we didn't have school. So what did we do? We drove pickup trucks and we went white water rafting. That's what we did. I never cow tipped. That was too dumb for me, all right? But maybe some of you in here have, and that's awesome. Uh, if you have, maybe we'll do it together one day. When we have our own cows to tip over, right, Kenny? <laughs> All right, so we are going whitewater rafting, and I knew we got to a place, we would drive our trucks up about 10 miles, and we'd get out, and we'd start floating down the river, and we got to a familiar part of the river, a part where there was a beaver dam, and I knew that you could go to the left, and you could avoid the mess that was over about three quarters of the river, and you could you, you hit these rapids really great. So we had a group of like eight to 10 people, six to 10, but I don't know how many it was. It was a long time ago. We had a group of people. We're floating down the river, we hit this thing, and I'm like, go left, go left. So we all get over to the left. We start going through these rapids, and man, it was awesome. Our tubes were flying everywhere, rafts were going, going like nuts, and we're all trying to survive just to make it through, right? And we get done, I'm standing on the shore on the rocks, and I'm like, let's do it again! And all my friends were like, no way, man, you are crazy! And so I took my best friend with me. We went up about, you know, 100, 100 feet up the river. We got in. We pushed off. And this time, instead of going left, the current took us to the right. And we got pinned against that beaver dam, ended up going underneath of it, right? And we made it to the other side somehow. But it was one of the dumbest things I've ever done, right? You got to ask yourself, is this an intelligent thing for a human being to do before you do anything, right? Anybody? Yes, that's what we should do. But one thing I recognized is that of all the dumb things I've ever done, so many, almost all of them, it's almost exclusively the dumb things happen when I'm with my friends, when I'm with people. There's something about being with people that encourages us to do dumb things. So it's important to pick the people you hang out with, isn't it? Usually it happens when we're somewhere we shouldn't be with people we shouldn't be with. That's usually how it happens. My mom always says, be careful who you hang out with. Be careful who you hang out with. If my mama don't like you, I probably shouldn't be hanging out with you. In fact, let me just give you this advice. If there's someone in your life that you're spending a lot of time with and the rest of your family doesn't really think that they're the greatest, you should probably listen to your family. I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm just saying that there is some wisdom in that. See, my parents knew so much more than I thought they did when I was younger. And there were people they didn't want me to hang out with, and I said, well, they need Jesus, and I'm the person to give them to them. And then I ended up bailing them out of prison. 
right? And then you end up doing things, compromising your values, doing things you never said you would have done. The company you keep is critical to pick the right ones. So the truth is this, is that God wants our life to be full of healthy relationships. God wants your life to be full of healthy relationships. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, three to ten people or 50 people or that you have to have 100 people. I'm just talking about your life should be full of healthy relationships. Different people can handle different amounts of relationships. But there's a certain amount where if you get to that, that probably isn't exactly healthy. Make sense? So the big idea is that God wants us to have full, our lives to be full of healthy relationships. God doesn't want you trying to struggle through life, right? He doesn't want you out there limping and trying to just get by. Listen to me, so many times there's something about this idea that when we come into church, we have to look good, smell good, feel good, talk good, and everything has to be okay. But the truth is, is that's not always the case. Sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life is hard. And who are you going to when you have no one to go to? I know we go to Jesus. I know that's the church answer. And that's the right answer. But how about after that? Who are you going to? We don't need to look good, smell good, talk good. It's okay to come to Crossroads and for not everything to be okay. Because we're imperfect people serving a perfect God. Things are going to happen. Here's what I want to do. I want you just to pause for a moment in your notes. I want you to write down the top five friends that are in your life. The top five friends. Some people are writing, some people aren't. Some people's minds just went blank. They have so many friends that... Your closest friends, the ones you spend the most time with, the ones that when things go wrong, this is who I go to. Wow, second service is overachievers. First service looked at me like deer in headlights. They were like... I'm not saying anything about first service, all right? Let's just get that out there. They're awesome. They're great people. They're, we had 50 people in first service, and they are all serving Jesus, just like everybody in here is serving Jesus. Some of you just don't know it yet, all right? Um, he makes us better. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So check this out. The reason I asked for five is because if you look up social sciences, that they'll tell you that you are the average of your five closest friends. You're the average of the five closest friends. And so who you're hanging out with is kind of a good indication of who you are. All right? And, and hopefully you, well, may, I mean, you don't have the same friends. You know when you go through high school and you have all these friends and you're like, we're going to be best friends forever, dude. We're going to do everything together. And then you graduate and you never see them again. It's not the type of friend we're talking about here, all right? That was a friend of convenience. There are friends of conveniences. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about healthy relationships. So you're the average of those five people. And I want you to do a few things. I want you to, to ask yourselves these questions. Does your life reflect the truth that God wants your life full of healthy relationships? Does your life reflect the truth that God wants you to experience healthy relationships? And then... The other thing I want to tell you and encourage you with is this, is that I am not up here today to tell you to get rid of this person, to never talk to them again, to tell them, you know, so long, sucker, I'm getting right with Jesus. My favorite is when people are like, Jesus told me that I'm not to have you as a friend anymore. And I'm like, way to make sure that person gets to hell, <laughs> right? I'm not saying you have to cut off relationships. Sometimes you do. That's the truth. Sometimes there's relationships in your life that you just need to say, no more. I can't do it. But that's not what I'm talking about because here's the truth. Is that God can take an unhealthy relationship and if he's at the center of that relationship, he can make it healthy. God makes all things new, including relationships, including friendships, including marriages, including all these things. You hear where I'm going with this? 
So the word has a lot to say about this. Let's jump in. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12. The wisest man that ever lived wrote this. It says, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asked himself, who am I working for? Who am I giving up so much pleasures now? It is all meaningless and depressing. I want to stop there for a second and I want to say this, is that this points out the fact that we're meant to be in relationship. Because this man is working, but he's not fulfilled. Last week we said you can have a lot of stuff, but you'll never get fulfillment from that stuff. Do you remember that? Our stuff doesn't give us fulfillment. Only relationship with Jesus gives us fulfillment. It also shows that we're not meant to do life alone. The man was all alone and his life was full of uh, depression and meaningless. It goes on, this... uh, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. How many of you want friends that help you succeed? How many of you want to be a friend that helps others succeed? If one person falls, the other person can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. No idea single people in the house. All right? Two people lying together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Healthy relationships are more important than wealth. Healthy relationships are important to your relationship with God. Bad relationships are expensive. Bad relationships can cost you everything. Life is meant to be experienced with friends that will help you out when you fail or when you fall. So revisit that list of five people and ask yourself, are these people who when I fail or when I fall, are they there to pick me up? Do they show up when I need a hand? And do I show up when they need a hand, when they need help, when they're alone? It's critical that your life is full of healthy relationships. And it's obvious to everybody that's here today that life is meant to be lived together as a team. Right? We laugh together. We cry together. We dance together. When the Seahawks score a touchdown, we party together. Oh, that's just my family. (laughs) Luis is a Giants fan. Sorry, Luis. We know what's going to happen. I should not have talked smack from behind God's podium, should I? That was bad. Oh. Just don't lie, steal, and chill together, all right? That's, that's where the... Oh, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Healthy relationships are, the, are centered on values and life events, not on things or special events. Let me say it again. Healthy relationships are built on values and life events, not on things, possessions, or special events. If you have an extra ticket to the football game, someone's going to be your friend. But it's not the kind of friend that you necessarily want in your life. If you have extra, there's always friends around. We saw this in school, right, with the kid that his mom gave him $10 every day for lunch. And he had so much money he didn't know what to do with it, so he bought every kid in the class snacks. They're all his friend at lunchtime. But when it comes time to pick partners for the the science project, nobody wants to work with them. That might be wisdom itself. (laughs) But you get where I'm going with this. When we have stuff, there's there's leeches out there. There's people who want your things. So you got to reflect on that list of five again. And you got to ask yourself, is this somebody that I should have in my life? Is this somebody that's there for me when I'm down? Because relationships are a two-way street. We get involved in these relationships that are take, 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 take. And it's never give and take. So carefully look over your friends and what's going on. Well, if you read the Bible, it's clear that God designed us for companionship. Oftentimes we make dumb choices when it relates to who we're spending the most of our time with. The majority of our time. We're feeling the need for companionship and oftentimes we're looking in the wrong places. 
We're filling it with the wrong people because it's convenient or because maybe no one else wanted to be their friend or because you're afraid no one else wants to be your friend. Let me just tell you this right now. Every person that's in here is a child of God and you are special and unique and you are awesome. And anyone that doesn't want to be your friend is a fool. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. Notice it didn't say, I'm going to give him a spouse. It didn't say anything about this. He said, I'm going to give him a helper. We know it's his spouse, but this, listen, we're going beyond a marriage relationship. We're talking about, what about, what about the single people? Well, God wants your life to be full of rich, healthy relationships. And so often we fill it with junk because it's easier, convenient. Or because that person always has their schedule free. Well, maybe that person isn't good for you to be around. Maybe that person is why you haven't gotten to the point yet in life that you knew you'd be to at this point. Inside of us, though, there's this need to be connected to others. We're relational. We need companionship. And that's because God designed us this way. He designed us in His image. And and John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you read, it talks about the the Spirit of God in Genesis chapter 2, hovering over the earth. And so we know that God is a triune being. Now check this out. This is really cool. God can have a conversation with himself. I don't suggest you do that, all right? You know those Bluetooth things? I always think it's funny because I think everybody's talking to me when I'm in the store because I talk to everybody. And so they'll be saying something and I'll respond and then they look at me like, and they turn their head and they have that Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. So, uh, Anyways, that was free. That won't cost you anything. Um, But check this out. God is in community with himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one. We're created in his image, but we can't really comprehend that. We have relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but God wants us to have relationship outside of that as well. Otherwise, he never would have given Adam Eve. He never would have given Eve Adam. Because we're created to be relationally together. Acts 2, verses 46 to 47, the day of Pentecost had come, the church had been established. Things are booming here, and this is what it says. And this is one of our core values at Crossroads is built on the foundation of this, this verse. So this church had just been established, and this is what it says. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Your, your church life, check this out, your church life is, be, is meant to A, be in fellowship with God, and B, with His children. This is a great place for you to establish relationships with other people. For you to get connected with the people that are heading in the same direction as you are. And sometimes we think that, that I met them in church, they're perfect. Not true, right? Because we've all been burned at church before by people. And there is no such thing as a perfect church. So if you walk through those doors and you thought this is the perfect church, that's not true. This is not a perfect church full of perfect people. This is a great church full of great people. And I'll tell you this, if you're new to Crossroads, Crossroads is a place with people that care about you, that love you with the love of God. They want you to succeed. We want you to succeed. When you succeed, that's God's will in your life taking place because you chose to come to church at Crossroads. And we love it when that happens. Well, Crossroads is doing amazing things and hanging out with your spiritual family should make you better. We're better because yesterday we served our community by distributing relief supplies. We'll be better today after we do two fish. We're better after we do trunk or treat together. When you serve together, God brings you together and you are better because of it. Serving the Lord in your local church is a great way to become better. And to have and experience better relationships. 
What do you think God, God feels or believes when people look for relationships in bars or clubs or, you know, when the whole time he's looking at them saying, you know, you could just go to church and you could experience people that are on the same path as you are. Because everybody that's here today, you're here, well, most of you that are here today are here because you want to be better. Some of you may have seen somebody cute coming to church and you're like, hey, I'm going to go, right? I'm just being real. I love it when I hear stories of people who are like, I went because this girl was good looking, because this guy, I heard he was there and he was, and then their lives are transformed with the, with the love and truth of Jesus Christ. I love it when that happens. It's great. While we all have different reasons, most of us, probably all of us are here because we want to get better. And that's the heartbeat of the people that are here. We want to be better. Andy Stanley says it like this, friendships determine the direction and quality of your life. Friendships determine the direction and quality of your life. You might be like so many people that I hear say, direction, I have no direction. I want to ask you, then look at the friends you're hanging out with and see if their life has any direction. A lot of times we get caught up in a lifestyle of no direction. And it really isn't necessarily even your fault other than you made the decision to hang out with who you hung out with. You do realize that who you hang out with and have relationships is your choice, right? And that whether that's a healthy or unhealthy relationship, that's up to you. So we need to look at them. We need to say, is this a good relationship? Or is the direction I'm heading in someplace I said I would never go? As a young adult, I found myself going to the bar like almost every night. To a place I said I would never go to do things I said I would never do. How did that happen? I hung out with the wrong people. I even knew it was wrong before I was doing it. So you can't tell me that the friends don't influence you. My mom would tell me, you shouldn't be hanging out with them. Mom, they need Jesus. When you find yourself compromising on your values in order to reach or help people in their relationships, you're in a bad spot. You're in a dangerous place. We need to watch ourselves and we need to choose wisely. Surround yourself with the right people. Healthy relationships make us better. So when I was a young adult, I didn't understand this. I thought my mom was crazy, but as, as I matured, as I met my wife, we started going to church a lot more, started teaching Sunday school together, started going to, you know, to, to church every week. It was, I mean, I was going before, but it wasn't like real. You know what I'm saying? I went out of obligation, not out of relationship. And then I met my wife, and, and she just... She took my five friend average to another level. You know what I'm saying? I was hanging out with five. Anyways, you get what I'm saying. She just raised the level. She took it up a notch. Made me better. My relationship with God got better. My relationship with everybody got better. Because my wife made me better. And all the dudes that are married in the place said, Amen. and all the dudes in the place that aren't married but are going to be in the future maybe said, one person. <laughs> so as I started serving the Lord, getting right with Him, reading His Word, I understood better that the people you associate with determine the path and direction of your life. And so over the last five or six years, these have been some of my best friends. One more. There we go. So these are my Tuesday night crew. We meet after everybody else is in bed. Our families go to sleep, and we have video meetings. One of them is a colonel in the Army. He's in South Carolina. One of them is a special ed school teacher in Washington, D.C. Another one is a real estate agent in Washington, D.C., and another one is a pastor in Virginia close to Washington, D.C. And God has united our hearts together. And when we get together for this, we're laughing, we're having a good time, but we're not talking about things that guys get together and eat wings and, and talk about together. We're talking about how are you doing as a father? How are you doing as a husband? How are you doing as a man? How are you doing with your relationship with God? How are you doing as a leader? We're, we're, Pro Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. 
And so we recognize that while we have this, while we have permission to tell each other we're being idiots or to celebrate with each other or to laugh or to cry or to do different things, we realize that we make each other better. And you've already seen two of these people that have shown up in Florida and we've only been here for 10 months, nine months. Because iron sharpens iron. Who do you have in your life? Now, when I was 20, I wasn't hanging out with people like this. All of those dudes up there, I'm not talking about myself, but all of those guys are wildly successful. They are incredible men. In fact, a lot of the reason why Crossroads had it, what it had after the storm was because of the men you see on the TV screen. So a friend falls, a hurricane hits their church, and they write a check for $1,000 for that church. Or they take an offering at their church for that church. And $4,000 comes through four friends and some others because when you fall, who is going to pick you up? When you're down and out, do you have the friends that are going to actually spend the time to say, hey, are you okay? Or do you have friends that are like, forget that guy. Forget, forget her. Because the people you associate is important. The people you associate with will determine the quality and direction of your life. So if you're not happy with the direction and quality of your life, then you need to look at your friends. Another thing that we know is that social media has made us antisocial. We don't even know how to answer the phone in America anymore. We send text messages. I'm guilty. Right? One of my closest friends in Florida, I text message him all the time. And I don't always hear back. And I'm like, did I do something? And pick up the phone. Ben, pick up the phone. And I notice something. Every time I call this person, they answer. And if they don't, it's because they don't have their phone with them. But social media has made us antisocial. We have a billion friends, but we have no real good friends. Some of us have thousands of friends on Facebook, but in our lives we can't even write down five. All we are to some people is a like on their Facebook page, a retweet on their Twitter page, or a heart on their Instagram, whatever that is. It's true. Because we have lost the art of actually having good, close, personal friends. Friends that stick closer than a brother. I'm not talking about posting on their wall, I'm so sorry about the loss of your mother. I mean, that's good, all right? I don't want to, but how about send flowers to them? How about show up at the funeral? How about show up at their house and say, is there anything I can do to help you? Because if we truly are like what Ron Jordan said at the opening, the hands and feet of Jesus, then we better get moving. One of the greatest things you can do to someone who's struggling is just show up. You don't have to have relationship with them at all. You show up and you just say, hey, hey, is there anything you need? Can I meet a need for you? That's how relationship starts. But we think we have to have been best friends from second grade in order to meet somebody's need who's going through a tough time. We don't. And I love the fact that Crossroads is full of great people because, you know, when Rose Beale had her surgery, people stepped up and they've been taking meals and they're there. So are we truly there when people have needs? It used to be six degrees of separation in the 60s and 70s. Now it's four degrees of separation. You're four relationships away from knowing any person in the world. This just shows us that the relationships have grown laterally, horizontally. But you have less close friends than you've ever had in the human history. Which means they're very shallow friendships. We don't want to be a church full of thousands of people with no deep relationships. We want to be a great church, serving a great God, great people that are experiencing great relationships. 
Bad relationships, this is the next fill in the blank, bad relationships negatively impact us. They hurt us personally and they can hurt those around us. You know, uh, it's very easy for a family member to, to, to drink and get drunk and get behind the wheel and have a kid or something in their car and take off and have an accident. They made the choice to do something stupid and they didn't just change their life, they changed the life of everybody around them. An extreme way to show this principle that bad relationships negatively impact us. So where is that found in the Bible, Ben? How about this, Proverbs 13, 20? That says, walk with the wise and become wise, associate with fools and get in trouble. Walk with the wise, there's a promise there. Become wise. But a companion of fools, one version says, suffers much harm. Associate with fools and get in trouble. I know I'm not the only one in this room today that has experienced that in real life. So the promise here is that if you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. I can still hear my mom saying, don't hang out with that person. Don't associate with them. And it wasn't that she was being judgmental or condemning. She just knew. Listen, my dad was the chief of police in a town smaller than Avon Park when we moved there. You think they didn't know everything about everyone? I should have listened. Because I did stupid things, dumb things, because I hung out with foolish people. Proverbs 18, 24 says this, There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. We all have friends in our lives that are good at destroying our life. So today I'm asking you, as you evaluate your closest friends, are they healthy relationships? Are they people that you really should have in your life? Proverbs 12, 18, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Do your words bring healing? Do your words bring healing to others? Or are we just good at tearing others down? See, we need to be encouragers. As, as followers of Christ, we need to be the best encouragers the world knows. I'm not encouraging you to lie and tell somebody that there's something they're not. But I'm encouraging you to be an encourager, to build people up instead of tearing them down. To say, you know what, I believe in you. You're better than you think you are. You can do greater things than you think you can. And we know this is truth because it's in the Bible. Whenever I'm around my wife and she says something um, negative about herself. Does it, are there any negative self-talkers in the house besides everybody, right? Yeah, we all are. We, we all have our moments. And anytime she says something critical or that isn't true and I know it's not true, how I respond is I always try to say, stop talking about my wife like that. So that's what I encourage you to use. When somebody says something negative about themselves, say, stop talking about my friend like that. Stop talking about my spouse like that. Stop talking about my son or daughter like that. And start seeing yourself for who you really are. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 to 34. This, is, this totally explains why no one is above this, this principle. Right? We think we're so good with God. Hold on. This might get good. We think we're so good with God that we can hang out where everybody else is sinning and not be affected by it. We can put ourselves in an environment of drugs and alcohol, maybe pornography or all this other stuff that we know so easily entangles. That's what the Word of God says. It says flee from all sexual immorality. Flee from sin. Flee from the traps that so easily entangle you. Run! See a sin, run away. Run. Because we think we're so good, but what does the word promise us? Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. And it goes on. And it says, think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. 
Or you think you're so good you can hang out with people that are sinning, but you don't even know who God is. We need to be careful with the company that we keep. If you don't like the direction your life is heading, then you probably need to associate with some different people. And I'm not saying that you actually have to just be like, hey, forget this, I'm done with you. Get lost, dead weight. There are times where that, that is, there are times where speaking the truth in love is mercy, right? Where you just have to cut yourself off. You know what God did for me? God gave me a beautiful woman to marry. We, he gave me a great job, moved me across country, away from the people that were negatively impacting my life. So sometimes it's easy for me to teach on this, but some, I know it's hard. I get that it's hard. You know, you have friends, you've been friends for a long time. I'm not telling you to stop being their friends. I'm saying, be careful how much time you invest with foolish people. It's pretty clear, right? Because if your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. And bad relationships negatively impact us. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me the people you spend time with and I will show you who you will be in the future. Craig Groeschel says, you may be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. So as I thought about all of this, I realized there's a guy by the name of King David. And he was a pretty popular dude. Right? And King David had some great friends in his life. And I want to just highlight three of them that stick out to us. The first one is the prophet Samuel. Jonathan, which was the king before D David, his son, and the prophet Nathan. And the first thing that friends should do when we look at the life of David and when we look at our lives is this. Friends should make us better. When you look at that list, does that person make you better? Companionship should make you better. God did not design companionship to make us worse. He designed it to make us better. So for David, this was Samuel. Samuel the prophet, he goes to the house of Jesse and he says, line up all your sons. So Jesse lines up all of his sons except for David. David is left out in children's church. <laughs> David's out in the pastures caring for the sheep. Right? Taking care of, of his responsibilities. Samuel looks at the first guy. He's like, this looks like a king. But God says, no. Looks at the next one. He's like, yeah, he he's, could fill the responsibilities and roles for sure. This isn't him either. He goes all the way down the line and he goes, is there anybody else? Like I told you to bring all your sons, right? Is there, is there somebody else? And the whole time God's telling him, I haven't chosen any of these. He's and so David's dad goes, well, yeah, there's one other one, but he's, he's the runt of the family. You know, he, he, we didn't bring him because surely, no way. David, king? Well, go get David. So they bring David in, and Samuel looks at him. And the Lord tells him, this is the king of Israel. This is the next king. Here's the type of friends we need in our lives, types of friends that don't see us for who we are right now in this moment. But friends who believe enough in us to see us where we're going to be when God does what he wants to do in our lives. See, Samuel saw a man of God and he saw the king and he made David better. Second kind of friend that we need to have is that they should help us find spiritual strength. They should help us find spiritual strength. For, for David, this was Jonathan. Now, this is a complicated relationship. King Saul wanted to kill David. And his best friend was the son of King Saul, the man that wanted to kill him. Talk about something that belonged on Jerry Springer, right? I mean, this is a, a, as messed up of a relationship as you can have. My dad's coming to kill you, but I'm your best friend. And there was a time where Saul was trying to kill David, and Jonathan came to him. And in 1 Samuel 23, 15 to 18, it tells us specifically what he did. He says, one day near Horesh, David received the news that Saul was on his way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. 
You are going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you. And my father, Saul, is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home while David, was stay, while David stayed at Horesh. Jonathan had all rights to be the next king. Right? I mean, son of the king. Hello. But Jonathan loved David enough to say, basically, not my will, but God's will be done. And not only that, David, not only do I believe you have what it takes to be the king, but I'm going to stand next to you. I'm going to support you. And what you really need to do, David, is trust the Lord. Trust God, because we need friends that when we're going through rough times, they remind us that God is all powerful, that he makes a way where there is no way, that he can do everything you need him to do and that he is all that you need him to be. No matter what you're facing today, let me tell you again, God is the answer. Then we need friends that tell us the truth in love. You can tell the truth just to get at somebody, can't you? But telling somebody the truth in love is something we need all our friends to do. For David, this was the prophet Nathan. So here's some backstory. He comes to David and he says, David, there's a rich guy. And he has thousands of of livestock. He has sheep and cattle. and, And then there's a poor guy in that town. And he has one little sheep. Just one. And someone came to visit the rich guy and the rich guy decided to have a barbecue and he used the little guy's sheep. He took it from him. And David gets really mad and he's like, well, he needs to give him back four times as much. In fact, he should probably just be killed. And Nathan goes, David? check sometimes we respond to people telling us the truth in love in a negative way we think i don't need that kind of friend in my life they're bad mouthing me they're talking like i'm you know the scum of the earth or this or that but a lot of times they're just speaking the truth in love when my mom told me not to associate with certain people like i thank god i didn't get in serious trouble she knew what she was talking about She was speaking the truth in love, but I was doing kind of one of these. And sometimes people come to us and they tell us the truth in love and we just ignore them. The people who speak truth in love to us are the type of people we need to be in relationship with. Not the people who lie or flatter or just tell us what we want to hear because they want something from us. But those who are willing to risk everything so that we know the truth. And in all of this, I want to tell you this today, that some of you may have come through that doors and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And all, all healthy relationships are built on Jesus Christ. It starts by saying, Jesus, I know that I've messed up. I'm a sinner. And and asking him to forgive us of our sins. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He forgives us of all unrighteousness and that we'll be able to live with him in heaven for eternity. So let's pray. Everybody's heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and you can just respond by slipping your hand up and back down. If you're here today and you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to ask him for forgiveness of your sins. Would you slip your hand up just as a sign to him? Okay, you can put it right back down. Any others? You can put it down. Anyone else? How about this? 
I need to get my relationship right with Jesus. Is that you? Slip your hand up. Yeah. Hands everywhere. Awesome. You can just put them down. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of that. To forgive me of all the dumb decisions I've ever made. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Lead me, direct me for all the days of my life. I love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.